as with all of our recent video card reviews of reference cards, we recommended waiting on the RX 480 until partner models came out from add and board partners like MSI, ASUS, and other folks working on cards, Sapphire, so forth. And so that's finally come to be. We have an MSI Twin Frozer 6 cooled version of the RX 480, and it is called the Gaming X, so it's the same naming scheme as followed for the GTX 1060, 1070, so forth. And the RX 480 reference card, when we reviewed it, was before the 1060 came out, and so at that time we recommended the 480 as the new go-to $200 to $300 card. And as the 1060 came out, of course, there's a lot more competition, so now it's a split market between the two, and you can check our 1060 review for more discussion on the explicit comparison between the 480 and 1060. But for today, we're reviewing the MSI RX 480 Gaming X, and this one is equipped with that twin frozer cooler, so it's a bit more advanced in terms of cooling potential. It's got a pre-overclock applied to it, and it's priced at $265 versus the $250 price of the reference card. In this review, we'll look at the MSI pre-overclocked 480 for thermal frame rate and overclocking performance. This is the specs listing of that 480 from MSI. The price for the card is $15 more than reference. It's still the 8 gigabyte model. And the card runs 8 gigabytes of VRAM clocked at 8 gigabits per second or an actual memory speed of 2000 megahertz. And the rest of the specs, as you might expect, are the same as the reference card. The architecture obviously hasn't changed. So we're really just looking at a pre-overclock and that's about it. Check out the RX 480 initial review for information on architecture. The cooler is where these AIB partners really differentiate themselves in design from each other and from the reference card. And this cooler is the Twin Frozer 6 cooler, so it's gonna be the same that we detailed at Computex this year and also in pretty much every card review since then from MSI. It's got dual push fans. As you can see, they are pretty large fans, and that is possible because the PCB is a custom PCB. You can see this one is actually a good deal larger than the reference model. And so it's not only taller, but also wider. The height allows MSI to fit the dual push fans that are pretty large on there, which is really a benefit to noise. So MSI can spin them at lower RPMs. They're larger, they dissipate more heat uh, per rotation, so to speak. And that allows a slower uh, fan speed and also better idles because you can leave the fans idle when it's under 60 Celsius load. And so that's just a noise consideration. The PCB is also wider and that's similar. It allows uh, this huge aluminum heat sink to be accommodated. And then there are three copper heat pipes which are nickel plated for the rest of the card. And those are uh, two six millimeter pipes and one eight millimeter pipe here. The card's heat pipes square out towards the cold plate which helps ensure contact between heat pipes and the aluminum fins that spread the heat. Greater surface area overall has been the primary push for this generation of AIB partner coolers on both AMD and NVIDIA GPUs. And the coolers, two 6mm and one 8mm heat pipe, are rounded on the outside, but uh, they do square out towards the middle. A base plate sits under the cooler, making contact to the FETs and helping with VRM dissipation, but also providing structural support in conjunction with the flanking back plate. And you can actually, if you look in the side, see some of the chokes sticking up from that base plate. Let's get to some testing. The bench you're looking at on the screen now is our test platform and our full testing methodology is defined in great depth on the website as always. You can hit that below if you want to read more. And you can also search the channel for 1% lows or for Delta T if you want to learn more about what either of these measurements for FPS and temperature mean. The peak average temperature of the MSI RX 480 Gaming X using MSI's updated Twin Frozer 6 cooler posts a load output of 46.16 Celsius with an idle of 7.54 Celsius and that's sustained entirely with passive cooling when doing idle. Most AIB partners including EVGA, ASUS, Gigabyte, MSI and most of the others at this point will spin down to zero RPM when under minimal load thus resorting to passive heatsink cooling. This is versus the reference cooler for the RX 480. The MSI RX 480 Gaming X posts about 10 degrees Celsius cooler performance overall versus the RX 480 reference from AMD. And that performance improvement is in line with our previous tests of AIB partner coolers versus the reference designs. Here's the over time chart. This shows temperature versus time. So it's the same data as the previous chart, but presented differently. For full over time charts, fan RPMs, things like that, check the link in the description below. As for our endurance tests, we saw nearly perfectly flat frequency output, and that's what we want to see. The frequency is able to maintain its defined setting by MSI, that pre-overclock, with greater stability than even the reference card was able to maintain a lower 
clock rate, and that's because of the improved thermal solution. Compared to the endurance of the RX 480 reference card, the MSI Gaming X rendition of the product is greatly improved in clock rate stability and in temperatures. And as always, for more thermal analysis, check the link in the description below. Before getting into FPS for this card, a quick important note. We posted a video about 16.7.3, the new AMD update to its Radeon settings and driver package for the RX 480 and other cards. And we were having a lot of issues with that driver set when we were actually testing this card, which of course this video rolls out slightly after, so things may change by the time you see the video. But the relevant point here is that we didn't use 16.7.3 for benchmarking because it was just not stable for what we were doing with the RX 480. And so we ended up just using the same driver packages we've been using for the last few reviews, which will be updated as soon as something stable comes out. So we're on 16.7.2, which is equivalent to 16.7.1, except it was the internal version. 16.7.2 for GTA 5 and for Doom, which supports the Vulkan update, and we're on the original launch drivers, which I believe were 16.6.2 for every other game on the bench. And as always, we'll update once the drivers are updated properly. Let's start with GTA 5 at 1080p. The MSI RX 40 Gaming X pre overclocked to 1303 MHz, managed a frame rate of 88 FPS average with 1% lows at 63 and 0.1% lows not far behind. Looking at the reference RX 480 clocked at 1266 MHz boost, we see an 85.3 FPS average, so not a huge gain but it does at least post a difference of 3.1%. For reference, the reference GTX 1060 rests at around 95 FPS average with 67 FPS 1% lows, and that's a difference of 7.6% from the MSI RX 480. We haven't fully tested our suite at 1440p with GTA 5, but just as a quick note here, we were hitting 64 FPS average, 45 FPS 1% low, and 39 0.1% lows with the MSI version of the RX 480. Black Ops 3 tends to show more favorable performance on AMD hardware, which makes it an interesting benchmark title. The game is also exceptionally well optimized for its graphics quality and routinely exceeds 100 FPS at 1080p high. At 1080p, again high, the MSI RX 480 hits 144 FPS average with a 117 FPS 1% low and 111 FPS 0.1% low. And that's a good gain over the reference RX 480, which is at 132 FPS average. So 132 versus 144, equating a difference of 8.5%. Black Ops 3 is a fairly clock intensive game, which is evident here. And in this instance, the AIB partner cards are enough of a jump with the pre-OC that it differentiates between 144 Hz gaming and just under that. For reference, the GTX 1060 Founders Edition card runs at 122 FPS average at 1080p. At 1440p, the MSI RX 480 maintains a 91 FPS average, still fully playable, with lows exceeding 60 FPS, and the reference card sits at around 83 FPS average. So a bit more than 7 FPS difference between the two. Our 4 gigabyte unit had some 0.1% low frame time issues with Black Ops 3 at 1440p, but was still at 80 FPS average. For reference, again, the GTX 1060 Founders Edition is at 78 FPS average, and that's just above the GTX 970 SSC, or super clocked, or as they might call it, super super clocked version of the card. For the curious, the MSI RX 480 was bumping 45 FPS average at 4K high, so you'd want to be at 1440p or lower resolution for optimal play, or you'd have to seriously tank your settings, because in Black Ops 3, with this setup, because the 0.1% lows were suboptimal, the RX 480, even from MSI, was choppy in Black Ops 3. Up next, Doom. Note that we're hoping to conduct more Doom tests in the future with Vulkan and Async Compute, and that'll be in the near future, but we're backlogged on GPU reviews right now. In the meantime, we're looking at Doom with OpenGL and Vulkan to quickly test API scalability within the game. At 1080p, the MSI RX 480 performs a couple FPS better than the reference card, as Doom is less clock rate intensive than some of our other titles we've tested. And the Gaming X 480 is at 87 FPS versus 85 of the reference card. Lows are comparable. The GTX 1060 is the one to keep an eye on here, by the way is at 98.3 FPS average with OpenGL, marking a reasonable lead over the RX 480. Let's switch, though, to the chart with Vulkan and OpenGL simultaneously. With Vulkan, this story sort of changes. The RX 480 now operates at 111 FPS average, with the MSI version of the card at 118.5 FPS average. The GTX 1060 FE posts nearly identical performance to its OpenGL output, at 97.9 FPS and is now behind the RX 480s in performance, so they've traded. 
1440p is a similar story. Looking at our OpenGL only chart, we see the MSI RX 480 is a couple FPS faster than the reference card, posting about a 5% difference. Both cards are behind the 1060 FE's 66 FPS average and higher low metrics in this chart. But looking at Vulkan and OpenGL, the MSI RX 480 Gaming X is now at nearly 80 FPS with the reference card at almost 74 FPS average. The GTX 1060 Gaming X from MSI is at almost 70 FPS. These new APIs are still finding their way into games and still working on optimization. So there's a bit of difference between how they perform right now, but it'll be interesting to observe performance as game developers start making the switch over from the last gen APIs to support next gen only builds. Moving on to Mirror's Edge Catalyst, 1080p Ultra has the MSI RX 480 Gaming X operating at 78.7 FPS average with poorly timed 0.1% lows at 35.7 FPS. And this has the card performing similarly to the EVGA GTX 970 SSC, but with significantly worse low frame times, and that is detectable to the player. For reference, the stock RX 480 from AMD runs a few FPS slower at 74 FPS average, and the GTX 1060 FE is a bit faster at 82 FPS average. At 1440p Ultra, the MSI RX 480 Gaming X sits at 51 FPS, closer now to the GTX 1060 FE, but the FE card, again, sustains better low frame rates. We tested plenty more games as well, so if you want to see Ashes of the Singularity for DX12 and 11 comparisons, or Metro Last Light, just for some really stable benchmarking, The Division and Mordor, those are all linked in the description below on the full review of the card. All right, so let's talk about overclocking. This is one of the more interesting points of an AIB Partner card. The overclocking process is the same on this card as with the RX 480 reference. We're using AMD's Wattman utility built into the drivers. And Afterburner will eventually come out, but it's not ready yet for the RX 480, so we didn't use it for this test. So we're using Wattman, and with Wattman, based on the stepping chart you can see on the screen now, we eventually settled on a 1360 megahertz overclock on the core, and 2150 on the memory. We pushed 2200, but it was just a little too volatile. We saw some flickering on occasion. Didn't do a hard crash, but it did flicker, and that's not stable. And when we pushed the 1370 megahertz, same thing. It would hard crash or it would flicker. So we settled 1360 and 2150. Note here that the MSI RX 480 can push to 1160 millivolts, while the reference card can only do 1150. So that is also useful for stability. We measured the maximum GPU draw at 240 watts when fully overclocked. And that's not the card draw, that's the GPU draw. So with the card, you add a bit extra for the memory and things like that, 40 or 50 watts more, depending on power target, memory overclock, and all that stuff. Results are what you see on the screen now in terms of the actual FPS performance. You can see we gain a couple of frames in some cases, for the most part, where just between where we were hitting with the RX 480 hybrid, which we were able to push to 1390 megahertz, you can see that in Shadow of Mordor, and the overclocked reference card, which we got stuck at 1340 megahertz. So the MSI RX 480, this card, is able to push an additional 20 megahertz or so on the core with this particular card that we have. It does obviously vary somewhat card to card. Uh, so we get an extra 20 megahertz, not a huge deal, but overall you're paying more for things like the cooler. That's where your extra $15 is going for the most part. So uh, with these overclocks, an important thing to note is that the extra OC we get, the extra 20 megahertz or so, is not accompanied by a screaming loud blower fan that you get on this thing. This, we had to keep it around 4,000 RPM, the fan, it's pretty loud at that speed. Uh, and that was just to keep it cool enough to per perform a 1340 megahertz core clock OC. This doesn't have that issue. It runs at about 30 to 40% fan speed. They're bigger fans. They spin slower in general, so they're much quieter. So that is the main trade-off here, in addition to the extra 20 megahertz. Now in terms of the conclusion here, the change between the reference card and this board partner card is not huge in most games with FPS, but in a couple games that are more clock sensitive, like Black Ops 3, you do see a pretty reasonable difference. In fact, it's enough to go from 130-ish FPS on this to 144 on this, which if you're a 144 hertz monitor owner, you're playing competitive FPS, that's a decent enough change where you would certainly want an AIB partner card if you didn't already. And by the way, we really don't recommend these. We don't recommend the Founders Edition cards either. It's just the board partners do a better job with cooling, and that impacts more than cooling. As you've seen here, it impacts the frequency stability as well. And you also get some pre-OCs applied if you're not going to overclock on your own. So 
in general, this was never really the core recommendation, even though we said the RX 480 is the new sort of $200 to $300 title holder. As stated in that video, we were indicating more for the partner models. Now, here's the thing. This is $265. So at $265, you're encroaching on territory of a lot of the GTX 1060 market, and that's a pretty powerful performer as well. They are very tightly tied in some games. The 1060 tends to outperform the RX 480 in a good deal of games. The RX 480 tends to outperform the 1060 in a good deal of games. It just depends on what you're looking at. For an example, with Black Ops and Doom, Doom on Vulcan, not OpenGL, we see the 480 tends to outperform the 1060. With other games, GTA, Shadow of Mordor, we see the opposite. 1060 outperforms the 480. So if you're playing one game very heavily, I would suggest that you look for benchmarks of that specific game. We might have them linked below and pick the card that looks the best for that game. If you're playing kind of a wide berth of games, then just look through all of our charts, figure out what kind of looks like it matches the most with what you're playing and, and pick from there. In terms of the overall performance though, certainly this would be a better choice than reference. I would recommend it and feel comfortable recommending it at the $265 price point, $15 extra. Not terrible, it's certainly within the Oh, it's only $15 extra sort of margin where you feel like you're pushing the budget a bit, but for the better cooler, much greater silence and slight better overclocking potential, though not a huge amount, it is worth it in, in my opinion and in the opinion of the folks at the site like Mike who helped me test these cards. The 1060 is your most immediate option to look at in consideration. We would recommend looking at the EVGA 1060 SC, review on that coming hopefully soon. And of course, the RX 470 is coming out very soon. We already published the release date on that as August 4th. So if you are trying to tighten the budget a bit, wait for our review of that, see what you think, and then pick between the three cards based on how much money you have available for a GPU. So as always, I'm not gonna tell you which card to buy between the 1060 and the 480. I will tell you, avoid this and go for a partner model if you can, because they are a lot better unless you really want the blower fan for some reason maybe an SFF box where the push fans don't work well. Uh, so that's all I will tell you. In terms of 1060 and 480, just look through the numbers. We've given them all to you. Pick based on the numbers because that's that's all you need to make a choice. So thank you for watching. As always, Patreon link the post all video if you like our type of coverage and comment below, subscribe, all that stuff. I'll see you all next time. There's another video card out.